In this next case, a teenage boy's desire to fulfill a foolish brag made to his friend whilst under the influence of drink and drugs led to the devastation of an entire community. 65-year-old Len Saunders was well known and loved in his hometown of St. Helens. With no children of his own, he was very close to his two nephews and his niece, Heber. He was a comedian, he was a character. He never took life too seriously, so he would always be the joker and he'd always lighten the mood. Row, 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 out gently down the street. His heart lay in the arts, so he would love to draw, love to act, love to sing, love to write poetry, and most of all, he was a performer and he was born to perform. Everybody knew him really as as Len Bernan, because that was like his stage name. That. He was involved in drama groups in St. Helens. As soon as you met him, you were at ease. He was great. But performing wasn't Len's only passion. He was always volunteering. He really cared about the community and helping people, and that was his lifelong ambition. He was one of those kind of people that was very generous with his time. If he was ever in any strife or anything, Len would be there with the helping hand. My earliest memory of Len's volunteering was packing up boxes of toys and stationery, etc., for the children in the orphanages in Romania. He would go every year driving in the van with his friend. All he wanted to do was help, and that was Len. He was quite happy, yeah. And by 2017, Len was able to combine his two loves by volunteering at the Luchum House Community Cinema in St. Helens. He would be doing odd jobs, but also performing, acting, getting groups in, assisting groups and writing. On the 21st of July, 2017, Len had been assisting friend Greg in fitting a new kitchen at the cinema. This was the day when the worktops were going on and one of them had slightly cut wrong and I was trying to rectify it. The Len was getting a bit concerned that he wanted to get off to feed his friend's cat. So about six o'clock, we finally wrapped up for the night. The friends then embarked on the walk home. We were just talking about Hopefully a pair of us have a nice weekend, maybe see you Monday kind of thing. Weren't really taking notice of what was around us. Just as Len and Greg crossed over the road, two teenage boys rounded the corner. He approached us quite nice, polite. Excuse me, mate. One of them just asked. Got a cig? A pair of us just looked at each other and says, no, we don't smoke. The next minute, Paul Len's on the floor. Have I just witnessed this? No, this is real. The older of the two boys had punched Len in the face. Where the ferocity of this punch came from, I've no idea. This all happened within the space of two or three seconds. So fast. It was an indefensible situation. The speed that it came had actually lifted Len off the floor as he pole axed backwards. The sound of his edits in the floor uh, is something I cannot describe. It's quite a haunting sound. I'm just looking at the perpetrator, young kid. His whole body size wouldn't have even indicated any kind of malice or anything. I'm then looking at his mate, and even he was as shocked as me at what had just happened. The perpetrator realised I was considering giving chase, and then them two ran off. What are you gonna do? When I saw Paul then on the floor, unconscious, there was a slight pool of blood behind his head. Obviously, I decided to phone the emergency services. It wasn't long before the police arrived, shortly followed by paramedics. The young policeman that turned up must have sort of had an idea of who was involved, because he actually asked me, are they still in the area? He said, but try and be discreet about it as you're looking round. 
But apparently they'd been approaching other people throughout the day. And funnily enough, out the corner of my eye, I did see them sort of loitering, which I thought was bizarre. Because surely if you've committed a crime, surely the thing you want to do is get out of the... Len was in a critical state with fractures to his nose and skull, and the paramedics were preparing to remove him to hospital. He can't breathe. He can't breathe. As they were lifting onto the stretcher into the ambulance, he was trying to remove the airway that they inserted, obviously, into his throat. <gasps> Police have called my mum and said there was an incident on the street and he's been attacked, and you need to contact the hospital to see if he's okay. I just thought, he's probably been hit, but he'll be OK. Based in London, Heba arranged to travel to Liverpool to visit her uncle the very next day. And when we got there, the doctor explained that he'd been put into an induced coma just to give his brain a rest because he'd been hit on the head. He just looked like he was sleeping. He didn't look ill. He didn't have any marks on his face. We then met with the police who were at the hospital and they explained a bit more about what happened. We were told that they knew who the people were who approached my uncle and they've arrested them and I think they let them go pending further inquiries. The impression I got was that they didn't have enough evidence to charge them even though they knew who they were. At that point, our focus wasn't really on those two boys because we thought to ourselves that this was all going to be OK. So we left the hospital that day confident that he's in the best place and he'll wake up. With this in mind, Heber returned home to London. We would call ICU every day. And after two days, we spoke to a nurse who said he's had another scan and then they wouldn't provide any further information on the phone and kept telling me I had to speak to a consultant. I think it was then that I realised that this is actually more serious than, than we first thought. We spoke to the consultant on the Tuesday and I said to him, what's the situation with the new scan? And he said that there's been quite heavy bleed on the brain and that he was worried that Len wouldn't pull through and it was pretty much explained to me that best case scenario would be a quite severe brain damage and worst case scenario is he's not going to pull through. On the 21st of July 2017, 65-year-old Len Saunders received a single punch to the face after a youth approached him asking for a cigarette. Suffering serious head injuries after crashing to the ground, Len remained in hospital in a critical state. In between visits, Len's niece Heber had been in constant contact with the hospital, and eight days after the incident, she received an update. We've received a phone call on Saturday saying that his situation has worsened and he's struggling. When we came back up, he was a completely different person. He looked visibly quite unwell. His body was very cold. He looked withdrawn. He looked like someone who was dying. It was surreal, really. You know, you, you just couldn't believe, you know, because, what, a fortnight ago, he was the life and soul of everything. It was very hard to see him in that state, knowing the, the bubbly character, the energetic person that he was. It's not nice to see the person that you love and have adored since childhood in a state that he didn't need to be in. On the Sunday morning, they've said, unfortunately, he's not responded to any of the tests. We now believe that his brain will never recover from this injury. So what's the update? They're saying that they've got to turn the machine off. He looks so peaceful. Len was a very, very dear friend. Yeah, I still miss him. 
it was hard to have to say goodbye to him, knowing that he didn't have to die. He was a fit and healthy 65 year old who was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Len's death now meant that the boy responsible for throwing the single punch that killed him was facing serious charges. We didn't hear the name until it was on social media, just after my uncle had passed. Everyone in the community seemed to know who it was. The boy in question, Luke Woods, was only 17 years old. He was slimmer than Len, and that's hard to say that, because Len was a very slim character. But he still managed to put up a fight on arrest. His reaction to being arrested was absolutely shocking. He tried to run away from the police. I'm not your zone. You kind of get a sense that Woods has absolutely no respect for authority. When the police come to arrest him, he physically resists. However, during police interview, when confronted with the fact that Len had died, Woods admitted what he'd done, accepting that he was guilty of manslaughter. He only did that because he was trapped in a corner. OK, Luke. Um... And he knew that by admitting it, he would get a third off his sentence. Whether he's killed him with the intent on the day, that's the differential between murder and manslaughter. Okay, Luke. But apparently he had no intent on the day of killing anyone. Well, for me, you shouldn't punch him that hard if you don't want to kill anyone. Just four and a half weeks after Len's passing, Luke Wood stood before a judge at his sentencing hearing. He could cut the atmosphere with a knife in that room. He'd brought about 80 members family and friends. We got to read out our victim impact statement and another close friend of Len's got to read out what he did in the community and I felt like it was important that people heard the type of person he was and how the crime has impacted on our family. He had his head down, he didn't look up at all, not once, the whole time that the judge was speaking. Luke Woods, you have been charged showed no emotion. The defence claimed that Woods had apparently been high on drink and drugs at the time of the attack on Len. And got sick. It was the last day of college and apparently they'd been drinking all day. Now, whether that was just an excuse in court, I've no idea, but... He didn't seem inebriated when he asked for the cigarette. Woods' violent behaviour towards Len, however, did have an element of premeditation. What's really disturbing about Wood's behaviour is he actually tells his friend that he's going to ask a random stranger for a cigarette and if they don't give him one, he's going to punch them. He meant to cause harm that day. Maybe he didn't realise how much harm he would actually cause. To strike an elderly man in the street is, is just unthinkable. With regards to sentencing, these were all seen as aggravating feature. So too was the fact that Woods fled the scene of the crime. However, the judge at the hearing did have to consider the mitigating feature of his age. We're quite aware that he would be seen as a child in the eyes of the law and that he will get a reduced sentence because of it and then he'll also get a reduced sentence because of an early guilty plea. So we were told to expect a low sentence. Woods was sentenced to four years and four months. Had he been 18, he would have got seven years because he's a minor and because he's given an early guilty plea, he's got four years, four months, which means he'll do prison time of two years, two months. It's such a small sentence for taking someone's life in such an unprovoked manner. Even the judge said, he said, if I could have sentenced you for longer, I would, he said, but my hands are tied. I was grateful that the judge acknowledged that if he was able to give a bigger sentence, he would have. I think that was really important for me personally to, to know that the sentence that he was given was given under restrictions of guidelines and not what the judge personally thought he should get. In addition, the judge chose not to place any reporting restrictions on Luke Wood's identity despite his age. 
meaning he could be named by the press. I would imagine that the judge decided to lift anonymity in this case because he's nearly an adult, but also because the severity of his crime is in the public interest to know. In his sentencing remarks, the judge noted that Luke Woods had taken a shining star from the St. Helens community, causing untold sadness and grief to countless people. This was reflected at Len's funeral, which took place two days after the hearing. My uncle was completely adored in that community. We were expecting about 200 people at the funeral. Close to 400 showed up. It was quite a big church. Every seat was filled and then there was a congregation of people at the back who were standing. We asked everyone to wear a hint of yellow in honour of Lem Banana, which was his stage name. And so it was a sea of black and yellow. It provided a lot of comfort to me and especially to my mum to hear all the wonderful stories as to how Len has touched people's lives. And it was no surprise that even in death, Len was still helping others. On the morning before he died, I said to my mum, I'm pretty sure they're going to ask you about organ donation. Have you thought about it? As a family, we came to an agreement that Len has helped people his whole life, and so why would now be any different? And of course, we would donate his organs because that's what he would have wanted. Len had carried a donor card since the 1970s, and as his life was drawing to a close, 90 miles away in Birmingham, 26-year-old single mum of one, Lucy Loveridge, lay critically ill in hospital, in need of a donor liver. The nurse come and woke me up and said, you've got a potential liver for you. I rang my mum crying. Um, my mum was up there within minutes of me phoning her. Thanks to Len and his family, Lucy received her new liver and the operation was a success. I was out within a week. I was getting stronger by the day. I was able to take my little girl to school, pick her up, and do mummy things again. And I was just getting healthier and healthier and better and better. Three months after my transplant, my mum wrote a card to the donor's family saying how thankful we are they've given my daughter her mummy back. The day that I received that card, it was a very emotional day. It was such a bittersweet moment. The two families arranged to meet. My mum had bought two boxes of yellow flowers. One was for Len and one was for the family. And they walked in the room and they hugged us. And we sat down and we started talking. Lucy was quite shy when she first met us and her mum spoke a lot about Lucy's story. And they also got quite emotional um, reliving their story because Lucy was about to die. It gives me and my family great comfort to know that he didn't die in vain and that he's helped so many people and that although his life has gone, he's allowed a mother to live on and to enjoy her life. He's given me my life back. He's given me my daughter her mommy back. So I'm just really, really grateful. And my little girl knows he's the man that saved saved her mummy's life. This case reminds us that just one punch can end a life and is a stark example that all of our actions have consequences. Had Luke Woods known that his behaviour on that day would have led to Len's death, maybe he would have thought twice. Through organ donation, Len has not just saved Lucy's life, but those of a further two people meaning some good has come out of this appalling tragedy.